Hi everybody. We're at the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're at the glaze table today. I've already glazed one batch of pendants that were very different than this. Um, some new techniques I was trying and I have them in my kiln firing right now. So I wanted to work on this batch of butterflies and show you one of the techniques that I like to use on pendants like this that have been carved because I want to bring out the detail that's been carved in, but I also want to treat the background surface with some color. I'm getting ready for an online show, a Facebook group that I'm a member of called Ceramic Art Beads Monthly. No, Ceramic Art Beads Market, same letters, different words. Um, so I have an online show Monday and Tuesday, so I need to get these in the kiln over the weekend so I can get the photographs done and ready to go. So I'm gonna just kind of start and wing it. I don't plan out color palettes for these. I like to build as I go along. You're gonna see that sometimes I'm not the most pristine with washing my brushes. So uh, a shame on me, because that's something I always told my students to do very, very consistently. Um, these butterfly pendants are cut from my own designs. I just cut out paper like a stencil so I can trace that onto the clay. I know that I do have even some butterfly cookie cutters, but I wanted to have my own shapes and not something that was commercial. Um, I tend to do a lot of these in more vibrant jewel tones, just because for how I'm about to do this, they show up better. And these are going to look a mess before they look fabulous. That's definitely the truth. Um, I also have a tendency to use all blues and greens, blues and purples, so I sometimes have to consciously pick up a warm tone, you know, a different color. Because I have my preferred combinations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what my customers want to see. So I have been working a lot with butterflies lately, and there's a blog post coming. I will confess I've been avoiding sitting down to write it because it's going to delve into some of the emotional baggage that has come with COVID-19 and quarantine. And on one hand, I know that almost everybody, everybody uh, can relate. But on the other hand, sometimes it doesn't feel very productive to uh, dwell on it. But it's influenced my choices on subject matter. So for that reason, I do think that it is um, something that I want to talk about. I'm very lucky in my new studio and my house where my day-to-day -day need needs are met. Um, and I, it, it just breaks my heart, the state of things and the suffering and the trauma and the worry that so many that we're all going through. Um, anyway, back to glazing. See, I digress. If I stick to my topic, there's much better flow. So you're going to see that I'm just dabbing glaze on a little here, a little there. Uh, the designs are symmetrical for the butterfly wings, but I'm just mix and match in colors as I go. These are going to be sponged back, so you're going to just see the designs as glazed, and the glaze will be washed off the surface. So I can work slightly messy right now, and that will be cleaned up in a bit. Um, definitely not a naturalistic kind of flock of butterflies, since they have um, moon phases in them and all different designs that, you know, not occurring in nature. But that's my prerogative. I 
I also did a little time lapse of some of these, this technique, doing some um, face cabochons. So I'll post that as well, and that way you can see a slightly humorous um, version of what's going on. I use Amico underglazes almost exclusively. I've used them all through my teaching career. I love their colors and their consistency. There's a great hashtag on Instagram called How I Amico. A M A C O is the company name. They're based in uh, Indiana, I believe. So that's the palette. If you can see this rainbow palette in front of me, that is my underglaze palette. I often have them put in smaller containers. You can see how thick that is. I think you can see how thick that is. Um, in the bottle, brand new, they're like heavy cream, you know, a little thinner than like ranch salad dressing. Um, I have a tendency to put them in smaller containers in case I go in with a dirty brush in case I spill it, and as a carryover from my classroom days when a student might, you know, spill a container or forget to wash their brush. So I'm guilty of the same things. Sometimes it's really nice to have them th as thick as they are in here because then it gives a little more body to the color. Um, and then I can get away with putting on one coat when they're thick, since the manufacturer does recommend, you know, two, two coats or more to kind of build up the, the color. They can be thinned with water, so they can be used almost like watercolors, depending on the, the piece that you're glazing. And so that comes into play a lot if I'm doing a more painterly tile. I think it's just about time to order more red. This container is pretty rough. Let's see. A lot of blues and greens in this grouping because there are so many uh, moon phases. But I did a batch of these for my last sale um, that were very different, very, very bright, summery, bright, intense colors. Turquoise and red together is pretty intense. So this, going over everything once first to have the colors go into the designs. And then I'm gonna sponge it back and then also do some colors on the top surface. So it's many layers back and forth, adding, subtracting, adding more. When I have them to a place where I'm happy with all the colors, all the impressions glazed, as well as, you know, some maybe sponging on the background surfaces, when everything is as it should be, then I will put a coat of clear glaze over top of it all so that will not only seal it, but give it a gloss finish. Almost there. These underglazes are great because they also mix uh, like paint since these colors are, you know, what you see is what you get. You can mix up different colors. You know, with ceramic glazes, a lot of times the color in the jar is going to change drastically when it goes through the firing process and the chemistry is affected. I'm not a chemist. I could go into more on that later, but that's all I want to say right this sec. So the nice thing about the underglazes is that they are 
stable. Um, these are the colors that they're going to stay. So it gives you a chance to do more painterly things and see what it's going to look like. You should see I have a very flimsy tripod and my phone is kind of jury rigged hanging out over the glaze table. It's not up very high, but I really don't want it to fall into all these containers of glaze, not only for the glaze, but for the health and safety of my phone. So I definitely want to work on a different tripod system. It's one reason why I tend to not be in the videos right now, because once I have this set up in a way that can show you my workspace, it's really fiddly to try and turn it around and not pop the phone out of the um, tripod, drop the phone. Um, I almost called 911 this morning trying to get the phone in the tripod because I held the wrong button for the wrong amount of time. So, yeah, I'll work on that. So that, that's round one. So let's, let me show you how different this is when I go ahead and sponge the surface off. I'm not gonna run the video for doing all of them, um, but I'll take a couple and show you not only what they're like sponged, sponged clean, but then how I might add more layers to them. Like I said, these are gonna go in the kiln tomorrow and they'll be for sale in a Facebook group, Ceramic Art Bead Market, um, starting Monday. I'll have a show there. So after that show, I'll post some on my Facebook business page. Um, I do sell a lot of these to designers who create their own wearable pieces with them, and I save some and use in my own pieces as well. So you can see it really just simplifies things. The background white clay is a little bit stained and I don't mind that. It's a little more stained on this one. So that has kind of a, an earthier feel to it. I'm gonna go ahead and, let's see. Just directly brush some brown in there and a little more on the body. So that directly painted won't get washed off. That'll stay there in those designs. So I rinse my sponge quite a lot. I try and keep it clean. Um, the next layer I wanna put on these is to do a little sponging. So I want the barest, barest amount, not much on the sponge at all. I don't want any big clumps. I just want to be able to give it a little bit of speckle. I like doing this on the edges too. So there, that kind of lavender and the teal, I think really contrast each other well. Pop. I don't wanna do the same thing on that one. That would be too much alike. So let's maybe do some turquoise on those wings. This is also nice when the glazes are 
in these small pots and they get a little thick because it's so much more effective to sponge them on when they're a little thicker. are getting there. I think I'll sponge a little bit more on them, but let's wipe off one more. I want to show something with a really high contrast. So a lot of these lunar moths with the moon phases on them, um, I want to have some dark colors. And then there's going to be a pretty high contrast with that white clay showing through. Just sponge that off a little bit. Well, wash it off a little bit. I want, I want those to be full moons. Down below, I want those to be crescents. Not exactly the right brush for the job. All right, there, that'll work. Now, in some areas where I want to get a little bit more speckle, but I don't want to mess up the moons that I just painted, I can use a stiff bristle brush and that'll do some of what I want it to do. Dry brush. And then just a little kind of stipple A little more purple on the body. So that seems to be going pretty well. Let me do a little more sponging on those first two and then I'll probably sign off so I can um, focus a little bit more. I have to go do a kiln turn up soon anyway. So that and a cup of coffee will be my plan. Oh, there. Mm, you know what? This. This is light green, velvet underglaze number 345, and it's awesome. It goes really well with purples, it goes so well with blues, it plays well with warm colors. There. I love it with the maroon in that. Okay, so those three I'm going to set aside and then they'll get clear glaze later. I will just, can't find my sponge. Um, to treat the back and finish it off and have it be presentable. I usually do all the backs once all the fronts are done, but I'll just do that so that it's not forgotten about, so it does have that attention to detail, and of course it'll have the clear glaze over it as well. So in that length of time I got that far, so you can see it's a pretty elaborate process. Uh, I like some of these that could have a gemstone dangle on the bottom. Um, this one might be my favorite of this batch so far, but I kind of love this leaf and turquoise crescent thing happening too. 
I don't have one of these for myself yet, so I keep looking at every batch thinking which one I want to pull and save for me. Um, pair with some gemstones, you know, and whatnot. But for now, that is a peek into the glazing process with my rainbow palette of Amico underglazes. Um, I love the product. I don't get any sponsorship or kickback from them. It's just something that I've used since the teaching years um, and still really like the consistency and the color palette and the quality of the product. So I'm going to get back to work, get a cup of coffee and then get back to work. So have a good Friday. Like always, uh, the links are below. Subscribe, hit like, let me know you're out there. Um, ask me questions if you want. I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.